his ability at work in our spirits. Thank him for partnership. Thank him for koinonia. Are you giving him all the praise? For his power at work in us. That the excellency of power may be of God. In Jesus mighty name we pray. In Jesus matchless name we have prayed. It is true that God can help men. It is true that the Spirit of God when he holds a man he can do wonders through that man. It is also true that the power of the highest can reside upon a mortal man and cause you to do extraordinary things. May all this be your portion tonight. In the name of Jesus. Everywhere you see the wonder walking manifestation of God in the midst of his people, the Holy Spirit represents the omnipresence of God. The Lord walking with them and that by his spirit. Hallelujah. He is the God factor in the midst of people. He answers to the ministry of Jesus, turning ordinary men to be extraordinary. This is what he's made out of our lives. And this is what he's making out of you tonight. A sign and a wonder, an ambassador, a witness, a battle ax that is efficient. You believe that? Cry in one minute and ask the Lord for an encounter. I am here again. I am here again. Go ahead and pray. Pray without distraction. Pray with absolute focus. I am here again. I am here again. I am here again. Someone cry to your maker. Don't look around. Pray. I am here again, visit me. Turn my mourning to dancing, my sorrow to joy. Give me illumination, let me encounter your wisdom. Continue the making process. Continue the building process. Continue my becoming, my emerging. For in Jesus, mighty name we pray in Jesus mighty name we pray give us mighty visitations and encounter tonight oh God change our lives by your wisdom empower us by your spirit for in Jesus name we pray please be seated God bless you I welcome everyone again it's good to be in the house of God this is where you are transformed this is where you are changed Beholding him as in a mirror, the Bible says we are changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. We are changed on the strength of what we know, on the strength of what we understand. And then the wisdom that comes out of that understanding as we act upon the word. In the name of Jesus, thank you very much for appreciating me on this Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to everyone, every man. By the way, I think I should do a tribute to the Father. So all men, once you are from 18 years and above, stand up. 18 years and above. If you are not sure how old you are, sit down. Hallelujah. 18 years and above, stand up. You have any adult sitting down except if he's sick. If not, ask the person, obedience is how people become men and women of stature. Um, I have taught extensively on fatherhood particularly, but let me say this. A father is beyond a man with a wife. A father is beyond a man who can have children or has had children. No. There are many married men who are not fathers. There are many 
procreators of children who are not fathers. The Hebrew word for father is the word Abba. The Greek is the word Pata. And both of them mean a source, sustainer, protector, defender. In the very definition of fatherhood are the qualities of a true father. Lend me your attention for one minute. There are four major assignments of fathers according to scripture. Number one is the ability to provide first for your household. Please listen. First for your household. It matters the order of priority. The ability to provide first for your household and then it extends to as many who are under your care. Number two, the ability to protect. The ability to protect is the second definition of fatherhood. Number three, the ability to mentor and create growth. There is no true father without mentorship and growth. Fathers have the mandate under God to mentor and to allow for growth. Number four, the fourth assignment of fatherhood is to create structures for continuity and succession. Continuity. Anything that dies with the father has stopped the man from being a true father. The proof that you are a father is that those who come after you must become extensions of your legacy. Are we together? Yes. It should never start and end with you except if it is evil. But if it is good, a good man, the Bible says, lays up an inheritance. You may want to listen to my message, Redefining Inheritance. So uh, my tribute to every father, I want to start by appreciating every man, every father who has done all these, or at least most of this. Responsible man who has provided for his household, protected his household, methodically mentored all within his care, and is about creating a system of godliness, responsibility, wealth that makes for succession even when you are not here, if Christ tarries. My salutations and my commendations to such because they are fathers indeed. But let me also encourage someone, by my definition now, you may find out that you've fallen short of God's definition of fatherhood. I still salute your courage the willingness to retrace your step and to start afresh. The beautiful thing about the gift of time is that it gives you opportunity to start again. Perhaps there's some father standing here and whilst you are standing, you are really feeling guilty because you have not done justice in providing for your home, even if you've prayed in tongues. You've not done justice in protecting your wife and children, protecting them emotionally, spiritually, you have created a tense atmosphere and your children dread growing in that atmosphere. You can change. Men can change. There's nothing embarrassing about the need for change. We all have had to change to become this way. And we will have to change to become the higher versions of ourselves. So while commending those who have done well indeed, fathers by this definition, let me propose to many who have fallen short of this definition to protect, to provide, to mentor, and to create a system for succession. You have the gift of life. You have the gift of a sound mind. Use it and begin to retrace your step within the time you have. But it's my prayer, particularly for the men in this house, that we will be noble men indeed, that God will help us to redefine fatherhood if you believe that, say amen. amen. Father, we thank you for every father, every man in this place. And extending this prayer to the body of Christ, to as many who are connecting. In the name of Jesus, cause us all to be noble men. Amen. By every definition of nobility, we obtain the grace to be able to provide. We obtain the grace to be able to protect. We obtain the grace to be able to grow and mentor those you have put within our care. 
and we obtain grace to be secured enough to raise other people who become extensions of our legacy. We obtain this grace as we make commitments to remain fathers and men with nobility and excellence. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and please be seated. Are you ready for tonight? Never forget that nobody comes to God's presence who intends to encounter him and then leaves without an evident change. God is still, as he always is, in the business of redeeming, transforming, and empowering. Redeeming the lost, transforming the believers, empowering those who will be witnesses. It takes redemption, salvation, to convert an unsaved person to become a believer. It takes transformation through discipleship and that through the word to now grow and give the new believer an orientation that makes that person a matured believer. But it takes the empowerment of the spirit to transform a believer to a witness. That transition does not just happen by knowledge alone, it takes power. And for everyone in this place, one or more of these is happening to you right now as you listen. If you are an unsaved person, here's your opportunity to come into the fold, this family of faith, and that happens through the power of redemption. It happens through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you are a believer here at any level, there is room for growth until you attain unto a state of maturity. And that happens by the word of God. When the word of God is accurately taught, communicated in love and power, line upon line, precept upon precept, that word transits you by giving you a superior understanding. And then for some who have attained unto a commendable level of maturity, it is important that you press for empowerment. Empowerment turns a believer to a witness. Now you are ready to serve the purposes of the kingdom with efficiency. May this be your portion tonight in Jesus' name. Fishers of men. Tonight, I want to teach something that I believe will bless your heart profoundly. I want to redefine for you the concept of soul winning. We're exploring the dynamics of winning the lost fishers of men. Two scriptures very quickly. The first is found in Luke chapter 19. We're reading from verse 9 and 10. Jesus came to the house of a tax collector called Zacchaeus. And when he was at the house, a few people became sad why Jesus would go to the house of such a corrupt and a wicked man. They wondered why um, he would leave every other place he needed to go to to be with Zacchaeus. And he said this, This day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Verse 10. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Take note. The son of man is come first to seek and then to save that which was lost. Second scripture, Matthew chapter 4 from verse 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 4, 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 4 from verse 18 and 19. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee, the Bible says he saw through brethren. This was Jesus now about to select disciples. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. The Bible says for they were fishers. That was their profession. Let's read verse 19 together. 19, when you see it projected, one to read. And he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. One more time. And he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Father, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. So the Bible tells us that God desires 
that every sinner be saved, the lost be saved, and then that the ones who are now saved will come unto the knowledge of the truth. And whilst he walked upon the earth, he made his manifesto very clear that his purpose of coming, Jesus now, was to reconcile men to God. His purpose of coming was not just to perform miracles. His purpose of coming was not just to deliver the oppressed as we know. His purpose was not just to bring increase and bring abundance. All of those were expressions, but primarily Jesus made it very clear as we have in Luke chapter 19 that his purpose, the Son of Man came to seek and then to save that which was lost. Many expressions in the Bible point to the fact that the concept of soul winning is not just one that is reserved for evangelists or reserved for serious Christians, but that it is a mandate upon every one believer and that without soul winning, many aspects of God's program will not happen as intended because based on the sequence of God's program for the nations, the first is soul winning. It is only the one who is saved that can become a believer. Then the one who is a believer that can become transformed and matured and the one who is matured becoming empowered, then the one who becomes empowered becomes a witness. So the whole journey to being a witness starts with the person being an unbeliever. And if soul winning becomes a missing part of that whole equation, we will not have believers, we will not have matured believers, and we will not have witnesses who can be able to carry out the purposes of God and the program of the kingdom. Are we together? So Jesus is about selecting disciples and I think it's very important to just stress a point here. Talking about the move of God, talking about awakenings, talking about revivals, it is important for us to know that revival is as powerful as the vessels that can be found and are ready to be used. Revival is not as powerful as the revival programs that happen. In order of spiritual priority, the first port of call in birthing revivals, awakenings, the move of God across any territory is that God must find men, men who are available, men who are faithful, men who are refined, men who are empowered. Are we together? The revivalist is the one who can cause revival. The one who is already awakened is the one who can sponsor awakenings. So Jesus is about to carry out this soul winning campaign that will start from his death, his burial and resurrection, but he needed people. They would later be witnesses, but at this point, they were ordinary men, up with their professions, fishing for most of them. And the Bible says that he went to Galilee. You can imagine that he went to Galilee and just watched the people there. And he saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, the Bible says they were casting a net. I can imagine Jesus just standing by the seashore and watching these guys. And he saw with the, the kind of skill that they used to catch fish. And once they were done, the Bible says they were fishers. That was their profession. The next verse, he allowed them to finish everything they had to do. And then he said, follow me. I want to make you fishers. But this time around, not of fish but of men. In fact, give us NIV. I like the way NIV puts it. Verse 19. At once, no, 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 go back to 19, NIV. Thank you. Come, follow me. It says, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Come first, then follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Hallelujah. There are a few things I want us to observe as we build an understanding for this discussion tonight. Number one, Jesus told the men in advance what they would become. When he met them, he did not leave them in the dark as to his intention for them. He proposed this idea to them that they could become fishers of men. Now it's interesting 
that there were certain things Jesus did not take away from them. The ability to remain fishers. The Bible says they were fishers or fishermen as we call it. When he called them, he made something a profound statement. He said, you will still be fishers. In other words, there are many skills you now have. You have made the job easier for me. I'm not going to remove some things from you. I will only redirect your mission. You will still be fishers. You thought on seeing them, he would say, I want to make you witnesses. He never said so. I want to make you apostles. He never said so. I want to make you men of God. Or I want you to be my disciples. He said, you are still going to be fishers, but of men. Verse 18 of that scripture tells us they were already fishers. That was their profession. They were fishers. And now he was changing their mission. Watch this now. He was changing their mission, changing their assignment, but he still left certain things that he found with them. He already found certain skills that they had that would make them to be useful in this new mission he was calling them into. So the first thing we have to understand is that Jesus Christ told them in advance that he wanted to make them fishers, but this time around, not of fish in the sea of men. Fishers of men. He still retained the word fishers, meaning the skill was still important, the zeal he found in them was still important, the discipline he found in them was still important. The skill that made them fishers would still be needed when they became fishers of men. The zeal, the discipline, it was just the mission that would change. Isn't it amazing that the skill, the zeal I wrote here, the discipline that makes you a fisher or in any profession, when God calls you, most times it's the missions that will change. But those disciplines you have built will be used even in that mission. Now, most people are waiting until the day they understand the call of God before they begin to build all the disciplines. Here were people who did not know that it was in their prophetic destiny to be apostles, their prophetic destiny to be witnesses and to be men of God. There were young people who found their father fishing and they got into that action. You will be learning shortly that there are many components that make a fisherman, a skillful one and an effective one. Jesus was not in a hurry to call them. He stood by the sea and observed. He saw something in them that would be needed in effective soul winning. He saw the skill. He saw the zeal. He saw the discipline. And he said, gentlemen, come. I want to change your mission, but don't throw away the skill. Don't throw away the zeal. Don't throw away the discipline. This discipline I have seen in you that has made you good fishers will still be needed when you become fishers of men. This is the first thing we observe. When God comes to men, most times it is the mission that he changes. The discipline, that means you do not have to wait until you understand your assignment to begin to invest in skill, invest in discipline, invest in strategic knowledge. It will not be a waste even when you eventually find your place. Learning obedience will be useful. Whether you have found your assignment or not, learning diligence will be useful. Whether you have found your assignment or not, learning time management, all of these things that make men efficient will not be thrown away just because God called you. This is very important. That means here up front, I will teach you that even if you have not found your place in life and destiny in terms of purpose, you can begin to build the skills of a fisherman because when Jesus calls you, you will still be a fisher. It's only that you will now become of men. Are we together now? Yes. Imagine if he came and met these guys folding their arms and he said, why are you people sitting idle? And he said, well, we're not doing anything. We're waiting for the day we'll be called. There's some prophetic word that one day will be apostles. Jesus would not have appointed them. The only thing they did not have was the mission, but the discipline was already there. Are we together? They began to build that culture of discipline already, that skill of efficiency already. It was easy for him to call them and switch them to their mission. 
Because whether you are a fisher of fish or a fisher of men, one thing will remain. You will be a fisher. Are we together? This is very powerful. Number two, Jesus said, come, follow me. The first instruction to becoming a fisher of men, he was speaking to people who were already skilled. And yet he said, come, then he said, follow me. You would think he would call them and say, leave being fishers of fish and become immediately the fisher of men. There are consequences if you skip this step in your becoming a fisher of men. No matter how professional you are, no matter how successful you are, one thing is for sure, when God calls you, you start afresh. This is for sure. Your skill remains, but he will not just switch you immediately from your life or whatever you were doing. The business of men is very delicate and it needs training. He called these people and he said, follow me. You will need a season of following. In other words, there are patterns you will need to learn. You will need to watch me do it. Watch my approach to the lost. Watch my approach. They followed him to the house of Zacchaeus. They came and met him at the well with the woman. Remember the woman at the well? They, they saw different templates. He was training them to be fishers of men. For every believer who desires to answer that mandate of being a fisher, the first assignment is not to go to the field. The first assignment is to follow. To follow and learn. Learn what makes for efficiency as far as winning the lost is concerned. Now listen very carefully. I wrote something here. That the first requirement in becoming an effective fisher of men is your training, not the fishing, not evangelism. The first requirement in becoming a fisher of men is your training, not the fishing itself, or in our case now, not the evangelism. It's amazing how many people want to evangelize. They want to be part of the programs that lead to winning the lost, but they will not allow themselves to be trained. You are going to be learning that your life will be laced with a lot of inefficiency and pain and defeat and regret even though your intention is sincere if you do not follow and you suddenly emerge yourself into a fisher of men you will cause a lot of casualty at the sea are we together jesus trained them he allowed them to watch his approach in dealing with men listen to me being a fisher of man of men is being called into the business of men. These guys were business people. They were not just called into the business of products and services. They were called into the business of men. And they needed hands-on training by following Jesus, by making observations. This is very important. I took out time to make a little study. And in that study, I tried to find out the training of a fisherman. What does it take for a man to be a fisherman? And I'm going to be drawing forth lessons from that training because Jesus said that we will still be fishers. It's only that we'll be fishers of men. And I took time to observe how a fisherman is trained. What are the factors that fishermen need to understand to be effective at fishing? Because they would be the same principles that will be used for effective witness especially soul winning. You will be learning why our evangelism and our soul winning campaigns and pursuits within the body of Christ is largely ineffective. Like I've told you, there's now, as we know, statistically speaking, above 8 billion people upon the earth and we have just a little shy of, say, 2.6 to 2.8 professing Christians across the globe. It's a very uncomfortable truth, but we have to understand and agree that something is wrong with the inefficiency of our witness, especially our soul winning. We have programs and conferences organized globally every year, every week, every day. There are many mission agencies across the globe 
doing, you know, you know, great things at different levels. But why is it that in spite of many churches, many conferences, many men and women of God, many church programs, it looks to me and statistically proven that there does not seem to be constructive advancement in terms of the lost who come to the fold. Something is wrong. And we will use today's teaching to examine what is wrong. The training of a fisherman. The training of a fisherman is also the training of a soul winner. There are many things that soul winners, believers who desire to be part of winning the lost, regardless your zeal, there are things we can learn from the training of a fisherman. And I want to run through a list with you, hoping and praying that as you listen, God will sharpen you, reposition you to become a very effective soul winner. You believe that? Shout a loud amen. amen. So I wrote something here before we discuss that there are fishing principles that can help the believer become an effective soul winner. We are going to be learning what makes a fisherman an effective fisherman. And from the mandate of Jesus, draw forth lessons from there that can make us become effective witnesses, effective fishers of men. Are you ready now? Number one. The first thing we have to learn in the training of a fisherman is that you need to understand the sea. You need to understand the sea. That is where you find fish. You don't find fish in the air. You don't find fish just on the ground. You don't find fish on a tree. If you want to be a fisherman, the first thing you have to understand is the sea. That is where you find fish. Are we learning now? Every fisherman knows that until you are trained to understand the dynamics of navigating the sea, you will never be able to catch fish. I do not know any professional fisherman who does not understand the dynamics of the sea. And the sea is a very complicated place because there is a skill to walking or living in the sea. Walking, W-A-O-R-K-I-N-G. Walking in the sea. There is a skill. If you do not know it, you can die at sea. How many of you know that many people have died at the sea? Because there are times that the sea can be calm, almost noiseless. But there are times that the sea can be boisterous. Many fishermen, like many believers, do not know that the sea is where you find fish. But if you do not understand the sea and how to navigate your way, that mission can become a mission impossible that kills you right at sea. And unfortunately, Many, many believers in the name of evangelism have died at the very place where they are supposed to save sinners. The sea for a believer represents the entire globe. Anywhere men can be found is likened to anywhere fish can be found. When you talk about the sea in our context as believers, we are talking about the entire globe. Now listen very carefully. We are fishers of men. And this is a training course. There's no fisherman, watch this, that finds himself roaming around, jumping and shouting around the sea. No. The fishermen observe the weather. Are we together? They observe so many things. And even when the sea becomes boisterous like you'll be learning, the skill that you deploy when the, fish, the sea is calm is not the same skill you deploy when the skill the, the sea is boisterous. Are you following me now? Very important. The first lesson in the training of a fisherman that can be brought to the training of a soul winner is you must understand the sea. Please look at me. My goodness. This world you see is the world of men. And like the sea, it is a very complicated space. Are we together? If you want to save sinners, and you do not understand the world you have found yourself in, you will get into the middle of things that you may never come out of. Every soul winner must be trained 
to understand the world wherein you will be going to save souls in. There are places across the earth that are harsh and merciless like the boisterous nature. There are places, I hope you know, that the fish in the sea don't stay at the same place. There are some of them, you can find them. In fact, just looking at the sea, you can see them popping up. But there are others who are deep down the sea. Many believers who want to be effective soul winners have never taken time to, they are not even interested in studying the cosmos, the world of men. And so we carry a lot of blind zeal in the name of evangelism, especially as touching our modern day world. There are many, many fishermen who have gone to sea and never returned back home. Like many people who went and suffered several casualties because they were not trained to understand that being a fisherman like a soul winner, lesson number one is you must study the sea. The world that we live in is not a world of compassion. The world that we live in is not a world of fairness. The world that we live in it's not a world with men alone. There are spirits cohabiting with men. You need to understand the world wherein that's where sinners are. The world that you are living in, that you are going to evangelize and win souls, is under the influence of this spirit called Satan. He has manipulated that sea with a, a way of thinking, a way of behavior. He's called the God of this world and that he's blinded the minds of the people. If the believer does not understand the cosmos, your witness will be very ineffective. If you're following me, shout amen. amen. So like the sea, the sea for the believer and for the soul winner represents everywhere men can be found. Abuja, Lagos, the city center, your village, everywhere men can be found, qualifies to be called the sea. Number two, the second training for a fisherman that is applicable for a soul winner. I hope you are learning already. If you do not know this, you will not truly be a fisher of men. You need to know the various kinds of fish there are at sea. Aha, uh -huh. this is a very important one. You need to have this at the back of your mind that there are various kinds of fish in the sea. All fish are not the same. That tells you immediately that your strategy will not be the same. All fish are not the same. Every fisherman knows that there are a multitude of fish or fishes as we say in the sea. According to National Geographic, I did a little study. It says there are about 32,000 living species of fish on the earth. Let me repeat that again for your knowledge. There are about 32,000 living species aside from the ones that are extinct. These are the various kinds of fish that are found across various seas on earth. You see why you need training? Because there are many soul winners. The first fish you were trying to catch was a whale and it swallowed you. Because just because it's a sea does not mean you go and catch everything there. Are we learning now? I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations See Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, glorified. Every fisherman like every soul winner must know that biologically all men are the same but spiritually just like the variety of fish we have i'm not an agriculturist but i know there are very many kinds of fish even that sea you see is divided into fresh water salt water they, they are not the same 
The way you catch some salmon or tuna is not the same way you catch a shark. There are vicious sea creatures you must be aware of so that you don't stand there with a small boat and a net as a fisherman and not return again. Are you learning tonight? Fishers of men. 32,000 living species of fish. That means different species of fish require different techniques. The way Jesus approached the woman at the well was not the same way he approached Zacchaeus. Are you seeing that now? There is wisdom that must be understood and deployed by every soul winner. There are many soul winners that have gotten into trouble because they did not know that this sea you are seeing called the earth has various kinds of fish. There are people who blindly went to preach with fanatism without help. They are in prisons today. And it's not just, I'm not talking of persecution or martyrdom. I'm talking of standing in a sea and not knowing the kind of fish that would come out. Every fisherman in training knows that you must know the various kinds of fish. Look up. Let me tell you the various kinds of fish that talk about the variety of unsaved people. There are people Jesus said are already close to the kingdom. That means all it takes, they are, they are overripe for a harvest. Are we together? Already by their personality and their disposition, they are, they are just one step into the kingdom. Morally right. Nice people, very thoughtful, very philosophical. By reason of their philosophical stretch, they have already gleaned attributes that make them responsible people. It's easy to receive the gospel. No argument. You bring Jesus, they embrace it. Another kind of fish. There are fish that you have to dig the sea, the ground, to bring them out because of how, how deep they have gone. Are we together? There are people as soon as you see them and say, look, I want to tell you about Jesus. They say, sit down. Where was Jesus born? I will tell you the date. At the end of it, you end up with debates and arguments and you see how much of scripture you don't know. They leave you feeling bad and they say, go and do your homework before you come and talk to me the next time. The problem is not the sea. The problem is not the fish. The problem is that the fisherman was not trained. There are various kinds of fish. There are fishes that bite and kill. Did you hear what I said? They bite anything, including other fish. You will meet them eating other fish before your arrival. Are we learning? When you are dealing with a fish that eats other fishes, you have to be careful. Ask any fisherman that you came and met the fish before your arrival. You met it eating. Have you seen, most of you watch Nas National Geographic, these great whales, they just open their mouth and allow these tiny fishes to just swim inside and they close it. And you want to use a hook to get that kind of fish? A fish that is used to killing. A fish that does not mind spilling blood. No, there is an intelligence you need. Is someone learning now? The way you win a naive, innocent person is not the way you win a cultist who can kill. At every point in his life, there are weapons with him. You need to be careful. There is a skill. Fishers of men. Are we learning? Hmm. There are people who out of zeal, they entered one chance, not by mistake, by themselves. Because they felt they wanted to talk to a group of six people by themselves with wisdom. And while they were speaking, they noticed nobody was responding, but the car was moving. <laughs> Until they got to a point where they said, come out. And they found themselves in a forest somewhere. Now, I'm not being sarcastic. We blame everything on the mission God gave us, not knowing that there is a training for fishermen. If the fish swallows you, most likely you are Jonah. If the fish swallows you, most likely you are not a fisherman. If he tells you to walk on, on the sea, even if you are sinking, he will hold you because it's his word that made you come. 
So sometimes we need to stop blaming God for the inefficiencies that have been experienced at the mission field. It was a product of zeal without training. There are people who have died as genuine Matthias. Honor to them. But there are people who have died the death of fools and the death of amateurs. God is teaching your fingers, your hands to war and your fingers to fight. That at the sea, just like the earth, the mission is, the field is wide. The heart is plentiful and there are a variety of fish. Are we together? If you're following, say amen. amen. The second thing every fisherman knows and every witness and every soul winner must know is that there are a variety of fishes in every sea. Number three. The third thing we learn from the training of a fisherman that applies to a soul winner in training is that there are various techniques for catching fish. When it has to do with the business of fishing, like it has to do with the business of soul winning, the mission is the same, the message is the same, but there are various techniques. And you know why by now? Because there are various kinds of fish. The third thing I needed to learn, I hope you are learning, that there are various techniques for catching fish. For instance, there's what they call the bait and the hook. That you tie a bait to a hook. You've seen fishermen do that? Usually that goes for a small fish that you can even lift by yourself. And so they put worms or they put whatever, a bait in a hook. And then they just throw it at sea or at a small pond or a river and they wait patiently. And they usually can know when a fish has taken it because it bites the, the bait together with the hook. And then they wind it backwards and pull it up and put it into a basket. Many of you have tried that. Many of you probably fish that way. Another strategy is to cast your net. The use of nets is called casting. That you can cast nets. And even that as I study, have various skills to do it. But I will save that for another day. At least these two tell you that to catch fish does not just require one approach alone. This is very powerful. There is the bait and the hook. And there is the casting using a net. And even that one happens in many ways. Are we learning? Write this down. Under point three. Not everybody will be saved on a crusade ground. Not everybody will be saved by a preacher. But everybody should be saved. Not everybody will be saved on a crusade ground. Not everybody will be saved by a preacher. There are many skills, many techniques, and many strategies. This is very powerful. It's a very important training that any fisherman knows that depending on what kind of fish, depending on what location of the sea, there are various techniques that you can deploy to catch the fish. Now listen carefully. Still on point three. I wrote something here and I want you to listen. Every God-ordained ministry in the body is sent by God to a particular group of men. Every God-ordained ministry in the body of Christ is sent by God, anointed by God, to fish a particular group of men. Boat hooks and nets are ways of catching fish. The hook must never downplay the net and the net must never downplay the hook. They are both methods of catching fish. Are we learning now? You must understand that for this evangelical work, these missions, these global missions, this soul winning work, it is not the method you know that is the only method. There are a variety of methods. God ordained methods. Please look up. How many of you know 
a group called the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. Let me see your hands. Full Gospel, you've heard about them, even if you're not part of them. You've heard about them. I've had the honor of preaching there. I preached at their world conference last year. Phenomenal people, intelligent people. It's a, it's a collection of literally, without exaggeration, some of the best business minds across the globe. This has lasted for a very long time. It was an honor that I had to speak to them last year phenomenally intelligent people literally across every nation now do you know that there are certain people on account of their financial status and on account of the things that happen around their life they will never have the opportunity to hear a preacher on a crusade ground because their lifestyle and where god has lifted them will not even allow them know that there is such a thing so god raised the full gospel businessmen's fellowship for instance now if joshua selman as a man of god having the privilege to shout on a crusade ground downplays the ministry of the full gospel businessmen there is literally a demography of wealthy people that will never be saved are we together number two how many of you know about any children ministry any children ministry christian children ministry cem uh what they call them now anyone at all for children how many of you know that there are many adults who frustrate that ministry because they feel what do children the children don't need to learn anything but how many of you know that every arm robber was once a child? Every prostitute was once a child. Every destroyer of destiny was once a child. And God knowing that it's important to train up a child in the way he should go and that not many parents know God enough to do justice to the destinies of the children. He placed a burden upon certain people to minister to the children. And yet those ministries in many places are neglected, ignored, and looked at as less of a ministry to apostolic ministries like this. The hook must respect the net. They are all tools designed to catch fish. They are only catching various kinds of fish. There is a net that is too wide to catch tiny fish. The fish will swim out of it gladly. The fish will not even recognize that there is a net there. Because the net is too big for that fish. Are we together now? Uh, so you will find that fisherman in a children's class. Teaching and jumping like a child. And you are wondering what is this foolish adult doing? Remember, there are tiny fish that your big net cannot catch. Yet they need to be caught. Are we learning? So the man or the woman... We had one of our fathers, I uh, think, um, what year now? School of Ministry. I think he was maybe now the second or third oldest person who had been part of the School of Ministry students. Maybe he's even following now. Great man. He was then in his 60s, approaching 70s. Or was it up to 70, I think? And this man could be so playful. I mean, he could just jump. And sometimes I remember then wondering, I said, can you imagine? As old as this man is, he has remained youthful at heart because these are the kinds of fishermen that were anointed. How many of you know it takes the anointing to still remain a child at 70? Because you are weak and tired and angry at life at 70. It takes the anointing to still make you have the zeal of a child. Fishermen. If we dedicate one koinonia service for children now, some of you will be sleeping even before praise and worship. Say, what is this children's thing now? Yet, that may be the meeting that saves your child. I'm just teaching you in this training that every fisherman, like every soul winner, if you do not understand a strategy, observe carefully and ask God, don't condemn. When you see Jesus with the woman at the well, don't conclude what is Jesus doing at the well. It is a strategy for her salvation. When you see Jesus with a madman in Gadara, don't conclude what is he doing with demon spirits. Watch to see what happens to that madman when he comes back to his right mind. Are we together now? Our witness is ineffective because through religion and the traditions of men, we have defined a path 
based on our religiosity and we are forcing and blackmailing people to go through that mold and that anybody I see with a hook if I'm holding a net or anybody I see with a net if I'm holding a hook is not a fisherman. You may be wrong. There are various kinds of fishes and there are various techniques for catching them. So when you see God anoint somebody with a unique ability just for prosperous people, don't condemn. There are souls in the business world that God has given that person a mandate to reach. If it is not your assignment, respect it and stay in your call, but don't condemn. You are losing fish. We have been losing fish to the religiosity of men. If you see a woman called into women ministry, don't say what is these women and all these their problem. They will soon start gossiping about their husbands. That is not your concern. There are women who will never be saved till a woman talks to them. There are women who the, the nature of their pain will require another woman like them to say, I know what we are going through. Are we together now? As anointed as God has made me by his grace, there are certain elderly people who will only respond to Baba Deboe's altar call. I can preach there and they are impressed, hitting their children and say, be like this man, don't be stubborn, yet they are not saved. They are hearing, even if I'm crying on stage. But Baba will come out and speak in 30 minutes and make an altar call and the woman will stand up and come up because there are various kinds of fish. We are all fishermen. Let's respect ourselves. There are many people who have mastered the art of using their hook, who are about to throw away their hook looking for nets. Unfortunately, your mandate does not need a net. If you carry that net, you will find out you don't even have the strength to swing it. You may follow that net into the sea. And there are many people who have been given nets, but the controversy with holding a net and swinging it, they would rather just hold a hook, but you will only catch one fish per hook. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up I remember many years ago there used to be this wonderful group um, it was a music group and they went through a lot of stress because they were not believed I knew the people were born again. I knew they loved Jesus with all their hearts. And I told them that time, I said, look, with the resources I had then, I will contribute gladly in helping you. Listen, let me tell you something about the body of Christ. We must be very careful. We are losing a lot of fish because we are destroying the efficiency of fishermen simply because they are tools for catching fish is different from what we are using. We need to be careful. If on my way going, I find someone who is a professional, how many of you know that there are many fellowships that are around many, you know, careers, like um, say for instance, the Immigration Christian Fellowship. I preach there every year. So you have to be a uniform person to even have access to that kind of place. I have the honor of preaching there every year. I've preached there for like eight years or so, maybe eight or ten years. Every year, at least once, I go there. There are people who have been born again there and the way God got them born again was to give them jobs with immigration so that they can attend that fellowship. There are many students, the only way they got saved was by getting admission. Because there are programs their parents will never allow them go. 
So you will find out that the child's jam score was not up to it, but God still gave the child admission because it was more than just getting a degree. God needed that child to be released from a hostile home, to be in an atmosphere where he can pray. That child will never be allowed to have a night vigil where he or she is coming from. That's how many of you got saved. The message is respect the diversity of ministries within the body provided they are genuinely born again and provided they love God. Don't make business people feel less of witnesses. Don't let drama actors, Christian drama ministries, feel less of actors. Don't allow worshippers, those called into the worship ministry. You may not like the way they jump, but don't be too quick to judge. Go and find out the investments they make in the secret before they come out to jump. Don't be too quick to judge. Just because they sing the way you don't want does not mean they are not singing to the glory of God. Are we together? Don't judge people called into campus ministry. They are ministries to young people. They will wear t-shirts and jeans and be jumping. Don't, don't laugh at those who are called into the ministry of fitness and they are using it for the gospel. Their job is to tell their story from losing so, so, so pounds. Now I am weak and they preach Jesus. We must respect the fishing tools that every fisherman carries. Now the truth I must balance is that there are tools that are not tools. For instance, if we see you standing with a knife at sea, you are not a fisherman because holding that knife that way is not a tool. So I'm not just saying we should just celebrate any tool. No, the tools may be diverse, but when you see a fishing tool, you know because you can see the assignment of that tool and you can see the result from using that tool. Fishers of men. Are we learning? There are many ministries that should not have died. They died today out of guilt because there was no more space for them in the body of Christ. We have defined by our understanding about God what ministries are of God and what ministries are not of God. And in doing that, maybe sincerely so, we have closed down many great ministries and it ought not to be so. How many women ministries have died today because we are attempting to manage excesses? How many music ministries have died today because we are attempting to manage excesses? How many discipleship platforms have died today simply because we did not understand the nature of their call? When you see a ministry not working in alignment, you'll be learning the key is not to destroy it. The key is to trust God for alignment. Is someone learning? If you're learning, say amen. amen. So number one. You need to understand the sea, the world. Are we learning? Number two, you need to know the various kinds of fish. We're still learning. Number three, you need to understand the various techniques. Are we still together? The various techniques that there are several ministries there are diversities of ministries across the body when you see the ministry of the man who was once a madman in Gadara don't be quick to judge it when you see the ministry of the woman who was once a prostitute who left her water pot to run and go and call other people and you see the woman who was once a prostitute saying come see a man don't be too quick to say it is not of God when you see the ministry of the woman breaking her alabaster box before Jesus don't be quick to see the wastage when you see the ministry of Joseph of Arimathea his ministry was not to follow Jesus for evangelism. When you see him buying the gravesite, don't say it's a waste. That's where Jesus will be buried. Number four, fishers of men. The fourth training that every fisherman needs to go through, which represents the training of a soul winner. Are you ready now? You must have a functional boat to gather the fish you have caught. You must have a functional boat 
to gather the fish you have caught. This is a very powerful one. You must have a functional boat to gather the fish you have caught. Luke chapter 5, please. Give us 4 and 4 to 6. If your boat is not strong, you can catch an amount of fish that would destroy the boat and end up destroying your life. Luke chapter 5 from verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, Jesus now, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Nets for a catch. Verse 5. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my net. Verse 6. And when they had this done, watch this, the Bible says they enclosed a great multitude of fish, but there was a problem now with that harvest, and their nets break. Their nets break. And I can imagine that the boat, that boat there that they now transferred everything to, the boat was even going down because of the size of the fish. Can I tell you? There are many people who God will not give the anointing and the mantle to bring a certain kind of harvest because their boat, their ministerial capacity cannot manage the kind of ingathering they will have. With all due respect, there are servants of God, there are Christian platforms. God cannot give them 1,000 souls in one day. There is no boat that has been designed to keep that fish. Number one is that there is nowhere to even take those people who are saved. Are we together now? We are preparing for a sound of revival and we have invested so much building a prayer team, building counselors in anticipation of the kind of harvest we know and believe by faith that God is bringing. You cannot be holding a crusade for instance and then you train just 10 counselors or two counselors. Something is wrong with your boat. You see, let me tell you this. Every time you catch so much fish and your boat is too small, something happens. Both you and the boat and the fish will be lost. Do you have systems in place to follow up the sinners that are saved? Or is it one man of God who will do everything and you will die of stress within one month because the problem was not the harvest. It was that the boat was not efficient. Are we learning? Every fisherman knows that depending on the kind of fish you want to catch, you must ensure that the boat, the boat can mean the church, the boat can mean your follow-up strategy, the boat can mean the people you have raised to be able to make sure and ensure that the souls, the sinners that are saved are not lost. I learned this from Reinhard Bonke of Blessed Memory. He used to have a pamphlet, a book called Now That You Are Saved. The moment you are saved, so what happens, his strategy was because he didn't run a church-based ministry. He usually organized his crusades in collaboration with the local assemblies. So before the crusades, he would do what they call fire conference and he would train the pastors to make sure that they are efficient enough to receive the harvest. After the crusades, the people who are already in various churches are distributed back to their churches and those who do not have churches are redistributed across local assemblies to make sure that there is a follow-up system and the strategy worked. Are we together? The same has been used with many great evangelists. There's no point winning 20,000 people, 5,000 people, and as soon as the people confess Jesus, they go back and there is no system to help them. They go back to their lives and before you know it, you will never imagine they were once saved. Training number four, make sure your boat is efficient. There must be structures on ground, a strong follow-up system, an establishment system for the harvest that we desire. 
Your harvest will always be wasted when your boat is too small. Your harvest will always be wasted when you have no boat in fact. According to scripture, no evangelist, you see, the pattern revealed in scripture, no evangelist should go and preach without a collaboration with local assemblies for the follow-up and the establishment of believers. So it is either you the man of God who is now the fisher of men already has a structure where the people can be incorporated in or you work in partnership with those who already have structures. That way, for everyone who is saved, you know that after one year, two years, you will still find the person in the fold. We have wasted a lot of fish after laboring to catch them because the boat had a problem. If you are learning, say amen. amen. You must have a functional boat that gathers your fish. You must have a strong follow-up structure. At least a pamphlet. I remember those days when we started our crusades, we used to have one sheet, you know, we just write out the plan of salvation and we hand it over. Just a sheet. Couldn't afford a pamphlet. And we just write a sheet that is given to unbelievers and have a system to follow them up. You've seen how we do it in Koinonia here. That when an altar call is made, they are led. There is a group of counselors trained. And there is a system to begin to follow them up. Number five. If you are learning, say amen. amen. Fishers of men. Are you ready for the training number five? That every fisherman needs to know this and that also applies to every fisher of men. Every soul winner. You cannot effectively fish in isolation. Write that down please. You cannot effectively, every fisherman knows this. Every fisherman is trained along this line and every fisher of men must know this. You cannot effectively fish in isolation. Respect and engage with other fishermen. You cannot effectively fish no matter how skilled you are, no matter how gifted you are. You cannot effectively fish in isolation. Respect and engage with other fishermen. Still Luke chapter 5. We read 4 to 6. Now let's read 6 and 7. Luke chapter 5. 6 and 7. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Shout verse 7 please as you see projected. Ready? One to read. And they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. This is the implication of praying for a harvest. This is the implication of soul winning. Soul winning can sink your boat when you do it alone. It can sink your boat financially. The demands it takes to maintain the souls that are now saved. It is the reason why when we are organizing global conferences like this, we are not afraid to tell people, come join. Join in any way, financially, through your prayer, because no matter how great you are as a fisherman, the kind of harvest God wants to bring may sink your boat if it's only your boat. So one financial helper can help your boat stand. One prayer helper can help your boat stand. Are we together now? There are many people's boats that have sunk or are sinking now. And they are genuine fishermen. Because of this ministry or this, this false approach to ministry of standing alone. No, even Jesus needed help. He had to carry the cross, but he fell on the way and they called on someone to help him. Let me tell you the truth. As a soul winner, as a fisher of men, do not be afraid to join hands with fellow fishermen to produce greater efficiency. 
right from the infancy of this ministry as we organized crusades, we would always open up doors to groups and other ministries who believe in what we stand for. It's always been a collaborative effort. You know why? Because in many cases, the weight of the harvest, spiritually so, there are people who are already praying now for sound of revival. There is a prayer team. You prayed for it today. And it continues up until that time. Because no matter how anointed I am, no matter how anointed we are, this is a body ministry. There are people today who are not even part of the Koinonia family, but have taken it as an intercessory project. They are the helpers. No matter how anointed you are, this ministry of soul winning is not for one person. You can be a professional fisherman. If the fish is too much in your boat, you will still sink. You will sink financially. You will sink in terms of your, your a stretching of yourself. With all due respect, when you read the Welch Revival, I'm speaking to the globe, Evan Roberts, According to history, as much as we have read, one of the reasons why the man died young, he was one of the youngest of the generals recorded that died. And what killed him was not a demonic attack. What killed him was stress. Because the revival was breaking out, there were awakenings. I mean, fire was all over the place. He needed to be everywhere at the same time. And there were no helpers. His boat was sinking till he died. There are many pastors who have died today because they would not embrace to say, you know what? I can preach in a crusade ground, but I don't have the grace to follow up unbelievers. I don't have the patience to follow up hundred complicated people. But there is a pastor who was a pastor by ordination. He can follow up the most stubborn member. Why don't you lean on the, the advantage of their grace for efficiency? Training number five, you cannot effectively fish in isolation. Respect and engage with other fishermen. Jesus himself told us that the major problem with the harvest is not the harvest, it's the laborers. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37, he says, surely the harvest is wide, but the laborers are few. That's the problem. There are few hands relative to the amount of souls to be saved. And you will think because there are so many preachers, so many churches, I'm saying this to you because if God has called you particularly, uniquely to the ministry of soul winning, don't say there are the Joshua Selmans, there are this and that. No, the harvest is wide. How many countries can you go to in a year? How many sermons can you preach? There are only 52 weeks, ladies and gentlemen, in a year. If you preach one sermon, one evangelical sermon per week, you only have 52 in a year. I was very touched when some gentleman began to, you know, find a way of translating our message, particularly to the Francophone nation. I visited a few of their nations and I've seen the hunger. And sometimes I feel so sad because of this language barrier. But the hunger to learn. Do you know that because of the hunger, some of them had to learn English so that they could understand these teachings. Very powerful communication of zeal. Being a fisher of man of men will require a lot of collaboration a lot of collaboration a lot of collaboration listen many more hands i wrote here are needed for this work let us not discourage and destroy the hands already available we are still looking for more hands let's not destroy the hands that are available if the hands are weak what they need is to be strengthened not destroyed not destroyed not destroyed what we need is not to destroy the hands that are available 
What we need is to strengthen the hands that are available. An ineffective fisherman is still a fisherman. He just needs more training. He just needs more purifying. He just needs more mentorship. But by the time a large sea has only six or seven fishermen, when sharks begin to come out, that's when you will see that more hands are needed. Because sharks are in the sea too. Whales are in the sea too. Other dead sea creatures are in the sea too. The ones that science has not even seen are in the sea too. We need more hands. Let me tell you the truth. We need more hands. We need more hands on campus. Years ago, I used to do a lot of campus ministry. Now, I don't do so much of that again. The time and the luxury is not even there. But more hands are needed. Because for many people who genuinely started experiencing God, especially in our generation, for most of them, their defining season spiritually started on campus. If campuses are void of real witnesses, there will be a problem there because Satan has positioned men too there. How about secondary school ministries? We started FCS right from secondary school. Remember? There are many secondary schools now when you go there to preach, you will start crying. The children will ask you questions as an adult that you want to cry. You know why? Because they've left all of them. The corruption starts from the teachers themselves, with all due respect. The kinds of things the teachers say as they teach, behave as they teach, is what begins to destroy the students right from secondary school. Primary school and elementary classes. There needs to be fishers of men positioned there are some of you god will give you a mandate to start a school not just for money you can make money through and any other business but it will be a burden in your heart you will not be able to run away from do you know why because the fish that your net will be that school that will bring all kinds of people the next apostles the next prophets i think about my life today and i look at the various stages of my life and the corresponding encounters that have built me by grace to what I am now. What if they were not there? What if those fishers of men were not there? What if they were ignored? What if they were discouraged? Pray in one minute. Lord, send laborers. Send laborers. Send laborers. Please pray in one minute. Lord, we still need more laborers. Laborers as preachers. Laborers as kingdom-driven businessmen. Laborers as Christian groups serving the purposes of God. Laborers as apostles on fire. Laborers as prophets on fire. Laborers as teachers on fire. Go ahead and pray. Laborers as missionaries. Laborers as mission groups. The harvest is wide. We need more hands. We need more hands. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you something. I'm still on point five. As I studied this scripture, the Lord ministered something to me in Matthew chapter 4, 21 and 22. Just because you are a fisherman and you are already fishing does not mean you will not continue training. I need to say this. Because there are many fishermen like there are many preachers i must say this there are many fishermen like there are many with all due respect churches and ministries the problem is not the zeal the problem is something is wrong with the fishing strategy let me show you something here matthew chapter 4 21 and 22 and going on from thence, he saw other two brethren having called peter and andrew the Bible says he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John in a ship with Zebedee, their father. What were they doing? Please shout it. Mending their nets. What were they doing? One more time. He still called them too. Something was wrong with their nets. And they were not ashamed. They stopped fishing. They took a break from fishing to fix their nets. There are many fishers of men in the body of Christ that may need to take a break and mend their nets. Just because you are mending your nets, your nets can mean your character. 
Your net can mean something wrong. An approach, wrong mentorship you received in ministry. Now you have found the light. Stop fishing. Mend your net. Mend your net. The Bible says, even though he saw that something was wrong with your net, I like the last sentence. He still called them. There are many fishers of men today at their current state, their fishing will be ineffective because something is wrong with their net. The Bible says, and I like this, when it has to do with mending the nets, both the fathers and sons sat down to mend their nets. It is not only sons that mend their nets. The Bible says John, his brother was there and their own father Zebedee, they all sat down. Something is wrong with the way we have been doing church. Let's reorder our steps. Something is wrong with the way we have been doing ministry. It's not bringing efficiency to souls. Mend their nets. Are we learning now? But the beautiful statement there is that Jesus saw them mending their nets and he said, that's it. You have passed the test to be fishers of men indeed. Come. Hmm. Just because he called you does not mean he's released you to fish. Sometimes the reason why he's calling you is because he saw repentance. Because you are ready. He saw genuine repentance. He saw brokenness that you are willing to do ministry right. Mend your nets. This may be a message for someone. You are called, but mend your nets. You are called, but mend your nets. Mend your nets by mending character. Mend your nets by bringing out the dross all the impurities that don't allow you to do ministry well. Mend your nets by taking away hatred. Mend your nets by going for further ministerial training and learn the other aspects of ministry that makes for efficiency. Learn, mend your net by adding financial principles to how you are doing ministry. Mend your net by learning administrative principles so that your witness is efficient. Mend your net by inculcating prayer in your ministry. Learn, mend Mend your net by incorporating the word of God. Whatever is missing can affect your net. Mend your net. This is not a message, tell them. It's a message for the body of Christ. I like the fact that when it has to do with mending nets, whether you are a son or you are Zebedee, sit down, mend your nets. Till the nations see Jesus lifted up exalted till the nations see jesus lifted up please hear this preacher there are many many nets that need to be mended the reason why we are not catching fish is not because we are not called he called us but there are many mendings that need to be done. Is someone learning now? Businessman, mend your net. Worship minister, you are genuinely called, but this excess is connected to the worship ministry is tearing your net. Mend your net. Go for a retreat and mend your net. You are a great preacher, but this anger that comes together with your preaching, mend your net. You love Jesus, but you love money too. Mend your net. Someone say, mend your net. You are talking to yourself, or oh, say, mend your net. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When I read this scripture, listen, when I read this scripture, I took out time, I started praying for myself first. Listen, gone are the days where you allow pride and ego to destroy you. If you find your net tearing, even if you are Zebedee, sit down. If you are, I hope you know who James and John were. These guys were not ordinary people. James was a powerful apostle. Eventually he would become. John became the beloved. But for them to become the beloved and James the powerful, they had to sit down. I like the fact that the Bible did not say their father told them, go and mend your nets. I am a father. Fathers can mend their nets. Sons can mend their nets. Experience in ministry does not stop your net from tearing. In fact, the older you are, I suspect the net can tear. 
mend your nets. When it has to do with mending nets, there is no pride over experience. I've been in ministry 10 years, 20 years, with all due respect. That is worthy of note, but mend your net. Because sometimes net tear just because of use. They don't tear because of carelessness. By the time you have been persecuted for 10 years, non-stop, maybe offense would have crept in. Mend your nets. By the time you have now become a millionaire or a billionaire, chances are excellent that the values that you kept when you started may be compromised because there's no need for money again. Mend your nets. Can we pray for the body of Christ in one minute before I continue? Lord, we pray. Go ahead and pray. We pray for apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers. Come on, pray now. We pray for businessmen. We pray for captains of kingdom-driven captains of industry. Lord, like Zebedee, like James, like John, we are in a season where God is mending nets. And this is everybody's call. Mend your nets. Apostle, mend your nets. You are called, but mend your nets. Prophets, mend your nets. Evangelists, mend your nets. Koinonia, mend your nets. Everyone can mend their nets. Check your nets. Mend your nets. Anger, character failure, inefficiency ministry. Mend your nets. You are called, but your, your witness, being a fisher of men will be ineffective until you mend your nets. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's read that scripture again. And then I move to the sixth point. And going from tents, he saw two other, what? Say brethren. Destined to be part of the fold. James, the son of Zebedee. And John, his brother. They were in a sheep. When you have a sheep, that is a flourishing ministry. When you have nets and their father was there with them. But he said, mending their nets. And Jesus was impressed. That you have a sheep and you still have the humility to sit down. Father, together with his family, he called them. He said, come, you should be part of this move. Mend your nets. Mend your nets. The mending can be restoring prayer to your prayerlessness. The mending can be cutting away from certain destructive ministerial associations. Are we together? That have taught you things that were not part of the foundation of your knowing God. There is a way we do ministry. There is a way we make money from ministry. You may need to mend your net. Your call is genuine. But in partnership with some of these wrong associations, it may not, be, it may not work out well for you. Mend your net. Maybe to be restored back to that ministry as a father, as a mother. To do it the way you should do it. Again, hear this as a prophetic word. It is true that you are called, but there is need for mending. Mend your nets. Number six. Are we learning? We are discussing the fishers of men. The sixth training that every fisherman must go through to be effective, and that applies to every fisher of men, and every witness. Are you ready for this? Fishing requires great patience, persistence, and discipline. Fishing hmm, requires great patience, persistence, and discipline. Fishing requires great patience, persistence, and discipline. Do I say it in another way? Soul winning requires great patience, persistence, and discipline. Like fishing, soul winning requires great patience, persistence, and discipline. 
wrapped up with genuine compassion. Oh, you must add that one. Soul winning is a game without compassion. Compassion is what makes soul winning authentic. Not ministry, compassion. Are we learning? Ephesians chapter 2, please, from verse 1 to 6. I have a very strong message here. And I believe this will help to support the strengthening of the body of Christ. Soul winning like fishing requires great patience, discipline, persistence, wrapped up with compassion. Can I tell you this? Sometimes the reason why we don't catch fish is that we get to the sea with such anger. The sea, we make it so boisterous, the fish run away. And by the time we throw the nets, there is nothing to catch. There is a skill to catching fish. Sometimes silence is the skill. You drop the nets there and you keep quiet and endure. Then the fish come and you catch them. Our impatience with the world of the unsafe is one of the reasons why they run away. Are we together now? I think that there is a growing hatred for the unbelieving world and it ought not to be so. God never called us to hate on people simply because they are not spiritual. It's a dangerous orientation. You cannot hate somebody, verbalize and vocalize your hatred, then wants the person to be saved. No. An unsaved person is not necessarily a failure. An unsaved person is just one whose eternal destiny is not yet in place. But as far as our world is concerned, an unsaved person can be a very successful person. Don't downplay their results. You cannot hate on a people and want them to be saved. No. Are we together? The level of anger and aggression that we communicate towards the unbelieving world, in my opinion, and respectfully so, I think is too harsh to bring that fish to our nets. Now, we are not called into the ministry of condoning just whatever, but there's something you need to know about an unsaved person. An unsaved person is under the influence of the prince of the power of the air. Give us Ephesians 2. Let me show you something. Ephesians 2, please, from verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses. Did you see that? Dead in what? Trespasses and sin. That is the state of an unsaved person. Verse 2. When in time past, Paul was reminding the church in Ephesus that once upon a time you were like this too. You walked according to the cause of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now, now currently works in the children of disobedience, there is a spirit that makes the unsaved behave the way they behave. Are we together? They are not just doing it, they have their will, but that will has been hijacked and manipulated. When you look at an unsaved person from this lens, it will plant compassion not hatred. Verse 3. Among whom we also had our conversation in time past. Watch this. Fulfilling the lust of our flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature, naturally, children of wrath, even among others. Verse 4. Hallelujah. But God, who is rich in what? not rich in power when it has to do with the business of the fishing man mercy must precede power when you have power without mercy you will use it to trouble the sea and you will drive it takes power to trouble the sea but it takes your mercy to be patient knowing that the fish are under in this case the war unbelieving world they are under an influence that is greater than them if they could help themselves jesus would not come to die but god who is rich in mercy 
for his great love wherewith he loved us. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, watch this, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Verse 6. The Bible says, and had raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places. Let me tell you the truth. By the privilege of God's grace, I am a soul winner. I've been in this business of soul winning for many, many years. This is one area I can tell you by mercy that I understand. And some of the greatest harvests that have come came through compassion, not power. Compassion. There are people serving in this ministry today. If you saw us at the time they were saved, you will not believe that God could turn Saul to Paul. Are we together now? Venting out hatred, venting out anger and annoyance against an unbelieving world. Listen to me. You are, anytime you begin to communicate a sense of self-righteousness, you lose that ability to reach sinners. Everybody was a sinner. In iniquity did my mother conceive me. Let us not forget how God saved us. There are two things I want to tell you to help you. And I believe this extends to the body of Christ. If you have been guilty in an area of sin before, be careful how you speak about it now that you are saved. The fact that you were a victim, there were others who were free while you were a victim. Since mercy saved you, Never forget that you could not help yourself. It was mercy that saved you. Extend the same. There is a way a once victim should not speak. Did you hear what I said? This is spiritual maturity. Once you have been a victim of any major aspect of sin or life, even if you repent, there is a way you cannot speak again. Mercy must be before you. Because if you could help yourself, while you were in that rut, there were those who were free, but they gave you a chance to discover. Give other people a chance to. Sometimes we forget how God helped us and we stand in self-righteousness and begin to shout and say all kinds of things. I repeat this and let Christ hear. If you were once in any rut or in any sin and God helped you, even though you are helped now, I am saying it, there is a way you cannot preach again. The fact that you were once Saul, now that you have become Paul, you see, you are saved by grace, but that innocence has gone. There are certain things you cannot say again. You remain an advocate of compassion for the rest of your life. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace that our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Hallelujah. Listen, you were a thief before you repented. Be mindful how you talk to thieves. You were immoral before you repented. Be mindful how you talk to immoral people. You were in anger before you repented. Be mindful that you were a victim of it should plant a greater compassion. Because if you could not help yourself, you should be touched with the feelings of people's infirmity, even more than those who were innocent. An ambrobber who has become saved should not preach to an ambrobber as if he never was once. No. Is someone becoming matured now? You were once a prostitute, with all due respect. Yes, I know that Rahab changed, but once upon a time you were a prostitute. So when you see a prostitute, don't tell her what a, what a shame. You are in prostitution. Don't do that. You were once there. It was the intercession of compassionate people that brought you to a point where the hand of God could reach you. Are we learning now? Yes. You were once an irresponsible father clearly irresponsible but now God has helped you the next time you see an irresponsible father draw from your pain I know what it feels this is the reason why when Jesus became a man you see when he went up to heaven he didn't stop intercession I know what it means 
to be on earth and to be persecuted. I know what it means to be betrayed. So when he sits at the right hand of the Father, he does not point fingers as saying, ah, you are supposed to preach as a preacher. Why are you tired? It's an embarrassment. He knew, he will remember when he fell on the way to Golgotha. We have not a high priest who has not been touched. This is the part of the ministry of the body we need to restore. There are many people who have been victims of yesterday and this is not a call for condemnation but that in your conversion do not forget the abundance of mercy that helped you. Give others a chance. It's not only Saul that became Paul. There are others too. Even Demas, if he repents, he can find life. Is someone learning? There are many wounded people in the body of Christ who have great grace upon their lives. We must be very careful. There are many younger people rising. They may make mistakes with their lives. Please do not misunderstand me. We are never given the mandate to endorse or condone sin. No. But I can tell you, with all due respect, you see, when it has to do with this issue of sin and righteousness, ba. Just leave it to God, though. You only talk about the one you know. Huh? With all due respect, you see in our world today, people who have been many years in ministry, some of them are sincerely coming out to say, look, I can't live a false life again. I've been living like this for 30 years. Say experience. Say experience. Say it again. 30 years in ministry is experience, but it does not immune you. It's only God that knows the true state of everybody. The day Jesus will come back, there will be surprises. Surprises. Are we together? There are many seas today that don't have fish around there again. You know why? People came with power and self-righteousness. A man who was once an irresponsible man now, for instance, God has helped you. You have repented. You are now a responsible man, husband to your wife. When you are talking to another irresponsible man, don't forget you were once there. Don't trouble the sea so much that the fish will run away and you are wondering why the net is not catching anything. It's the reason why sinners don't come to church again because it has become an aggressive place of hostility. We will preach against sin. We will preach against unrighteousness. But not from a standpoint of self-perfection. Because by the righteousness of the law, the righteousness of ourselves, nobody can stand before God. Hallelujah. There are many wounded people today in the body of Christ. They cannot run anywhere to find help. Do you know why? Because everywhere has become a place with a sword. One time Peter removed the sword and Jesus told him, put your sword back. Now is not the time for swords. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. Again, I remind you, when it has to do with the business of working on yourself, whether you are Zebedee, you are John, or you are James, sit down and mend your nets. Are we together? We've driven many, many, many fishes. Let me tell you, soul winning requires great patience. Great patience. I've studied many revivals. And sometimes it is amazing how many people keep interceding over these lands for years until fire finally falls. How many of you know that there are women who have prayed for their children and for 10, 15 years they kept interceding? You would never think the child will be saved. One day, they just saw the child. After 20 years of not seeing him, he came back with a Bible. What is all this one now? He said, Mama, I'm a preacher. And she says, Hallelujah. So I was going to see a preacher in my lifetime. What if you looked at the child? What if you told them, I like the story of the prodigal son and the, and the father. Do you know that even when the son went afar off, the father had everything to himself, but he could not rest. I know my son is somewhere. Provided he's alive, there is hope for him. Provided he's alive. One day he just felt within himself. The man left his house and said, I will leave the 99. Let me begin to look for that one. 
and it coincided with when the one prodigal son said you know what I will sit here in pride and shame I will arise and go to my father and I will say father I have sinned against you now if you go to your father with your hand in your pocket and say after all it's just a, a slight glitch in character you, are, you, are, you must be something is wrong with that son he should return back to the swine that is not a glitch in character many years with the swine you need to come with a heart broken but when brokenness is there compassion must follow he held him and kissed him the bible says restored his signet ring came back home and said put music together but the elder son who committed the same crime as the younger son the only difference is that one did it in his heart whereas the other one acted it out two of them were prodigal sons one was prodigal in his heart nursing bitterness and anger the same way someone committed adultery fornication in his heart another person committed theft and lust in his heart whereas another person acted it out and had physical consequences two of them will stand as the elder son and the younger son but i tell you before that father all of them need redemption the story of the prodigal son was not about one child it was about the compassion of the father to his two sons are we learning now this is very important if we keep destroying our wounded soldiers in the body of Christ a time will come we will, we will stir up that sea that all the fish that should be saved will not be there again I pray that a time will never come when the only people in church are old people because all the young people would have run away we have driven them with our sense of self-righteousness we will never tolerate evil never tolerate licentiousness but let me tell you one truth ladies and gentlemen we must obtain grace from God to show compassion I will repeat it one last time if you have ever been a victim of any lifestyle anything at all that is not good and God showed you mercy there is a way you should not preach no if you are a man of God and you did ministry wrong and God help you I hope you know that when you are in error not everybody is in error there are people who are already out but they were patient till you found grace allow others pray intercede this has been my philosophy in ministry as you point hands at people one day you'll find out you are pointing a hand at your own child and because you have refused to take that hand back when you want to retract it people say leave that hand there because that hand has always been there huh when you keep pointing hands and say judge them judge them one day as you say judge them you find out the hand you are pointing is your wife and you want to bring it down and say no the same rule applies to everybody hallelujah I have met powerful people today I have met preachers who have come to me with charms and said apostle I love the Lord sincerely but I was serving this and that and that this one happened but I'm genuinely called now the you don't help those people by saying okay that's fine you are fine you are not fine there is still a net to be mended however it does not stop the fact that God called them there are many young people maybe campus people with all their energy doing ministry wrongly but it does not mean they are not called they just need mentorship and guidance to let them know you can become but not this way let us not lose both the harvest and the fishers simply because we are troubling the sea the ministerial sea in Nigeria is too troubled the ministerial sea in Africa is too troubled the ministerial sea world over is too troubled you don't catch fish by troubling the sea too much there is a skill to effective witness there are times when you need to be silent you see the wisdom of the fathers now that sometimes you see them silent they are not silent because they are not seeing what is going on in the sea they are silent because they are nets they are put under they are allowing the fish come then they fold the net and now they can sort out everything let me tell you the truth if you want ministry especially to the nations you are going to have to come with a compassionate heart 
there are things I believe as a man of God. There are things that this ministry believes and stands for. But in dealing with a global audience, you will have to create a lot of flexibility for several things. Not compromises, but several things. You will have to keep your reservations, but obtain the grace to stretch a bit to be able to accommodate a large collection of fish. Not everybody will dress the way you want. Not everybody will talk the way you want. Not everybody will behave at the moment you want as the way you want. Not everybody will come to church or come for that crusade the way you want. Our advocacy is to stand for righteousness without compromise. But that in doing so, there is a skill to fishing where you throw your net before the fish arrives. So when they are coming in their variety, you keep quiet. Your silence is not weakness. You are allowing the silence of the sea to bring the fish so that when you close the net, now they are within your reach and you can save even to the uttermost. Are we learning? As a man of God, you will go to preach somewhere. You will see people dress anyhow in very disturbing ways. That may not be your philosophy, but you will need to have a bit of accommodation. I preach in all kinds of places, and sometimes people do all kinds of things. Some of those practices will not happen in Koinonia by the grace of God. But you will need to have flexibility enough. That's why God invited you for the program because he saw that something was wrong and in your preaching if in love light will come an adjustment you see nets i repeat again can be mended in fact nets can be changed you can literally throw the old net the old way of doing ministry the old way of doing life and then carry a new net Sometimes the nets can be damaged beyond mending. You may need to throw it. And God, the real fisher of men, can give you a new net. Are we learning? Let me encourage, before we get to the final key. Soul winning requires great patience. Men and women of God, all who are the cutting edge of fishing men, let us learn this. Mercy and compassion must precede power. Mercy and compassion must precede power. Go ahead of power. There are times that mercy and compassion will tame power and say power now is not the time to act. Be silent and wait first. Let the fish come. When you are about lifting the net, that's when you need power. But before the fish arrives, you may need mercy and you may need compassion. Mercy and compassion is not indefinite tolerance of evil. No. It's not indefinite tolerance of carelessness and compromises. No. But I can tell you, study from the life of Jesus. I wish I had the time, would have gone to Luke 19. You would have seen what happened in the house of Zacchaeus. That's what happened in the house of Zacchaeus. The statement to seek and save the lost came as a result of the anger of the people. The Bible tells us that Jesus was on his way going and Zacchaeus climbed a tree because he was a short man. And Jesus saw him and said, Zacchaeus, you climbed the tree just to see me. You know what that means? That even though the man was a corrupt tax collector, when he was alone in his house, Something in him told him this is not the way. Most of the people you think are stubborn are not stubborn. The Holy Spirit is still working. You are just not seeing what he's doing. That stubborn child, that, that stubborn whatever it is, that person doing ministry in a way that is not correct, there is still the ministry of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Zacchaeus climbed the tree to see Jesus. And Jesus said, because you have shown interest in me, come down. I change where I'm going. I'm going to your house. And when men saw that he went to his house, give us verse 6 since you've tempted me there. The Bible says he made haste. He came down and received him joyfully. Meaning, while you were saying corrupt Zacchaeus, 
God punish you as short as you are. He was in the room saying, God, I don't like being a thief, but I cannot help myself. The prince of the power of the air. And God was looking at his compassion. The day he saw Jesus, he received him with haste. Seven. And when they saw it, they murmured. Is that in your Bible? Saying that he was going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Verse eight. And Zacchaeus stood and said, watch this, by himself, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore. Now, while all of that was happening in Zacchaeus' house, you were not seeing it. And so you would conclude outside. What is Jesus still doing? Two hours in the house of Zacchaeus, whereas salvation had come, not just for him, but for everyone he had defrauded. Could it be that the woman you have been talking about, while you were talking about her, she's been fasting and praying, saying, Lord, I know that I don't deserve to be used. I, it's true that I went to a, a herbalist as a mother to have a child, but it was ignorance. And while they are praying, you are there saying Jesus will not come. Don't be surprised when you see Jesus in the house of many Zacchaeus. Many. You will decorate your house with falsehood and self-righteousness. And Jesus will pass your house and go to a short person somewhere. A short man means someone that does not meet the standard. And Jesus said, let me come to your house. Let's finish that scripture. I hope someone is learning tonight. Look at the man. Meaning that it was already on his heart. He said, half of my good, I'm going to give the poor. And if I have taken anything, I'm going to restore fourfold. How many of the people who were accusing him could do that? Verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, because of this state of hunger, openness, brokenness, and repentance, this day, salvation is come to your house for as much as you too as backward as you are you are still a son of abraham when i promise abraham that in thee all the earth will be blessed that covered you too verse 10 for the son of man is come even to the house of zacchaeus to save and seek the lost don't go to a beer parlor or go to a brothel and say, Apostle said, go to Zacchaeus' house. You will die there and you may not come out. Let me balance it because believers hear all kinds of things while you are laboring to teach on stage. Don't go and look for trouble. You stand near Sodom, you enter into Sodom. Are we together? But I'm saying the person who entered the house of Zacchaeus was Jesus. Was who? Jesus. Only Jesus can enter the house of Zacchaeus by himself and come out free. If you are not Jesus, you can knock at the door and say, Zacchaeus, I brought good news. Seven. Fishers of men the seventh and for this our discussion final lesson that every fisherman needs to become professional and every fisher of men every soul winner needs are you ready you must be mindful of your safety as a fisherman while you fish there are safety practices that must be taught every fisherman if he must survive the business of fishing to return back home safe, even with fish. There is nobody who goes to the sea. I remember years ago, while we were going, I was going to preach at Bonnie Camp. And we arrived at Port Harcourt and needed to go by sea. And so the army came and they dressed me, the life vest, and wore all those things and I looked at myself flattered and proud of myself first for being a preacher but then at least for being a sea person for the next minutes that would take us there 
and I learned all kinds of things from that journey. You could see me with my vest looking happy and that thing was a bit heavy and I was wondering, did I have to wear this? But that was what was required for my safety. Should anything go wrong? I remember one time we were returning and then one of the boats, something happened and it was there, not moving, just under the waves. I said, no, Lord, I, I have served you all my life. <laughs> Come on. Where is the God that calmed the sea? Are we together? How many careless fishermen have died not because of demonic attacks? They were not taught that the business of fishing is a risk. Did you hear what I said? The business of fishing, whether a fisher of fish or a fisher of men, once you are a fisher, it's a risky business. And there are life vests there are safety mechanisms that you must put in place. For instance, if you are a fisherman, you must know how to manage the cold that will be at sea. Sometimes what can kill you is the sheer cold that is at sea. Sometimes when I travel to regions of the world and it's so cold, and you find the people there, they are not even, they are already used to it. And I'm thinking, do these people want to die? I'm wondering what to do with myself. With all that anointing, the cold did not spare me. There are times you can die of cold. So if it is the sea you are going to be for a long time, when God gives you a jacket, don't throw it away because it is heavy. Carry it. When you are leaving your house, you will not need that jacket. But once the night comes at sea, while you are patiently waiting for the fish to come, Sometimes you are doing nothing and that cold will blow left, right and center. You will need that jacket. And then when you now begin to sail and you don't have your life vest, sometimes you will need your, what they call that thing? That paddle to be able to row your boat. If you throw it away and you say the rivers respect me. No, there are skills to remaining. There are times that you need to understand the jurisdiction of fishing. How many of you know that even waters have jurisdiction? There are laws. Now I'm speaking intellectually. There are laws that govern fishing. There are fishing laws in certain nations. You can see a fish jump. If you jump inside that river and catch that fish from that river, you are going to jail. Yes. You just watch it. Whatever it is, if you want to eat fish, there are restaurants usually close to it. But you don't just go and catch the one there. So it does not mean that just because the fish is there, you will jump at it. No. Especially in the world that we live now, you must understand the jurisdictional component of soul winning. A particular state in this nation, I would mention the name. Um, years ago, I remember we went to preach there. And when I got there, we're talking with a few of the pastors, the leaders, and they told me, they said in this nation, they don't have a problem with church. But the moment you are caught trying to save someone, directly preaching to someone, you're going to get into trouble. You can have church, whole church, whoever believes in you before they arrive, the city can come and join you. But that they find you actively trying to win someone, you are in trouble. There are jurisdictions. Now, it does not mean, I told you that fishing whether a fisher of fish or a fisher of men is a risk. Sometimes it will cost you your life. This is why you are mandated to love Jesus Christ before you start fishing. Because there are times you may go to that sea and sadly, no matter how careful, you may not return. But the joy is that even when you are no longer there, the net was full of fish. Someone else can catch that fish. And there is a crown that is waiting for you, the Bible says. Are we together? What are the safety nets that every fisherman must put? Number one, the intercessory prayer ministry. That is the first safety net. Don't go to catch fish without a strong backing of intercessors. In about a month now, we're in US and we're in Canada. And like you were told, prayers have begun. 
if you've not joined make sure you join in your home personally sow that seed of prayer when you are going especially to deep waters transcontinental waters your first safety is not the life vest you wear because storms are products of the boisterous nature of the sea and the wind you cannot see there is a spiritual side to this are we together every fisher of men must understand that you must on you must have a strong prayer backing a strong prayer backing men and women who are praying lord as the word of god comes let there be a harvest of soul i studied reinhard bonker's model of evangelism as to find out why his evangelistic approach was so effective across africa in spite of the language barrier and one of it was that months before they launch out their campaign christ for all nations they would invest in intense moments of prayer and fasting clear that air he said brethren pray for us as anointed as we are pray for us can i tell you it takes more than english and understanding bible to win the lost there are ancient spirits that will not allow territories to be open and you just dive in there with intellectual sense no prayer are we together number two the second safety feature that you need when you are a soul winner is to practice periodic retreats periodic retreats now it may be difficult for you to believe this but a time can come in your life where soul winning can become a ritual that produces distraction you can be distracted literally doing soul winning that your spiritual life dies while you are at sea nobody lives indefinitely in the sea once you are done you must retreat back are we together now there are many people it was not evil that destroyed them they just became so they became so into the ritual of church the ritual of preaching the ritual of evangelism that they forgot their personal work with god so personally their prayer life has gone down personally word study has gone down but because they are in the mission field aside from intercession there are times you need to draw back not just to mend your net but to have a time of retreat fresh fire fresh revelation fresh engracing re-strategizing again and then you can go back to the sea that happens whether you catch fish or not because sometimes when you catch fish you can be busy with the business of fish that you may not even know when you are hungry yourself how many of you know that the tanker that carries foil is also foiled is that true the tanker that carries gas gasoline diesel it has to it can stop full of gas but stops because the diesel that powers it has finished there are many people holding nets full of souls but they are and they don't the energy eventually they will fall out of exhaustion and the nets will open and the fish will run back to the sea It says even the young men will be weary. Are we together? The youth will utterly fall. The young men shall utterly fall and the youth will faint. Isaiah 40, 30. It says, but they that wait. The fishers of men that wait. The witnesses that wait upon the Lord in prayer in periodic retreats they shall renew everybody say renew one more time the word re means again like before as before restored to the original and even better state renew their strength because that's the first thing that has failed their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint every soul winner needs to retreat you don't retreat just because you are failing or winning. It's a principle of survival. 
I believe in mission work. But there are many missionaries right now who need to take a break and leave the mission field for one or two months. There, there, there will never be an end to the souls that need to be saved. They need to return for one or two months. Connect back to their families. Find strength. Because how many of you know that work in the mission field can be psychologically exhausting? Not just spiritually exhausting. Psychologically exhausting. There are times that I go to preach, especially when I travel. Once we are done counseling, seeing people, now I'm still anointed. But that physical exhaustion, sometimes I can feel it. My body literally can start shaking. Where you are debating whether to eat or to sleep. You are choosing which one is more profitable at that time. And while you are thinking, your body chooses for you. Because it doesn't have time to waste. You find out that you've slept. is when you wake up. And by the time you wake up, the morning session is already getting. You have to pray and prepare. Let me tell you the truth. This business of fishing, especially when the people you are catching are men, it can exhaust you. And Jesus wept. Jesus cried before Lazarus's tomb. He was emotionally moved. Jesus wept at Golgotha to the point that his sweat, believe mixed with tears, became like blood. Let me tell you the truth. There are times when you have to be very sincere and admit to yourself. Let me have your attention, please. Some of you right now are serving God, but what you need is just some time to go and sit down. Let someone else preach to you. You have been the one shouting at everybody, but you need to be fed yourself. You need to just sit down and let someone comfort you. You see that now? That's why I was blessed so much last week when I just sat down and allowed my wonderful school of ministry students. They were doing all their thing and doing all their preaching. And I just sat quietly. How good it is uh, to just sit down and watch them do what they're doing. There are many reasons why people die in the mission field. Some die because of ignorance. Some die because of demonic attack. Some die because they were not trained well. They dappled into deep waters without training. Some died because they were alone. They did not see the value of the contribution of other ships and other fishers. Some died because after laboring to gather the fish, exhaustion made them to fall back into the boat and the fish spilled out and everything went so that all their nights and weeks of waiting became wasted. Listen to me. He calls us to be witnesses. But the first assignment of a witness is not to be a revelation communicator. It's not to be a power manifesto. It's to be a fisher of men. And tonight we have borrowed from the training of a fisher or a fisherman the scriptural principles that help men to be effective. Most of you have seen where you have gotten it wrong in your attempting to fish men. That may be the reason why your relatives have refused to be saved. You have been throwing nets for years and it has not brought any harvest. God is teaching you right now so that the next net you catch among the many fish that will come you will see your father in that net, your mother in that net, your siblings in that net, even the ones who are afar off, maybe some of your classmates, your, you have so trained your net that when you threw that net, it could go back into your 10 years before now and draw people. And when you look at it, you have to call other people. Finally, my father is saved. Finally, my mother is saved. Finally, this idol worshiper in our family, the net can reach anyone if you are trained to know how to throw it. Let me recap one last time and then we'll pray. The principles that help people to be effective fishers of men. Number one, you need to understand the sea where the fishes are found. The sea here, all winner, is the entire earth. 
you must understand the spiritual, the sociological composition and the implication of living in a world and an age like ours. Number two, you need to know that there are various kinds of fish. All fish are not the same. All men are not the same. Their levels of resistance to the gospel is not the same. Their levels of aggression, their personalities are not the same. This means that you must know how to deploy the right strategy for the right fish. Number three, you must understand that there are various techniques for catching fish. Like there are various methods, various approaches given to men to win souls. That everybody will not be saved using the strategy you were given. But the most important thing is to respect the diversity of fishing strategies. The diversity of God ordained ministries within the body. And respect their various skills and their various contribution to this fishing. Number four. That you must have a functional boat to gather your fish, to gather your harvest, to avoid waste. Are we together? That means you must have a functional structure, platform, follow-up system, establishment system. If you cannot have one, you must be connected to one that preserves the harvest. So whether it is a hook you use to save one sinner, you have somewhere the person can go to for his spiritual nourishment and he's built up from that point. Number five. You must know that you cannot effectively fish in isolation. You cannot effectively be a fisher of men, a soul winner in isolation. No matter how effective you are as a person, effective you are as a ministry, it will take the collaboration of other fishers of men for efficiency to happen. The meaning of that is that we must not discourage the laborers that we already have and that it is not unusual for fishers of men both young and old both fathers sons and children he says i write unto you fathers i write unto you young men i write unto you children when it has to do with correction and adjustment regardless the ministerial experience there is something to learn there is somewhere to mend your boat as we said to mend your net. Number six. That fishing requires great patience, persistence, and discipline. So soul winning, just like fishing, will require patience. You can follow up one soul, sometimes for years. It will look like you are failing till you see the power that is released at the point that person gets saved. I do not believe that the day Saul met Jesus, that that was the day his process started. I want to believe that there had been a build-up. Are we together? We need patience. Never forget how God saved you. Never forget the various things you were saved from. And I taught you in discussing that point that we need to allow mercy and compassion to go before power. Power is important, but not before mercy. When mercy goes before power, when compassion goes before power, it tames power so that power is used in a way that benefits but does not destroy. So that we do not make the sea excessively boisterous and then to drive every other fish. Seven, that in fishing, like soul winning, your safety is also God's concern and that you must know that there are safety systems that you must put because God wants you as a fisher of men to last. God does not want you to do ministry for 10 years and go down, 2 years and go down, 5 years and go down and people will say this man was once a powerful man, this woman was once a great woman, this church, this ministry was once powerful. That language, Ichabod, should not be heard in your destiny. And that whilst you fish, it is a risk. There are spirit transactions that happen at sea. There are sociological transactions that happen at sea. There are emotional transactions that happen at sea. And you must garrison yourself with the right safety systems. Number one is that you need 
the prayer and intercessory ministry backing you. Number two, you must know how to practice retreats. There are many more. I just gave you two. In fact, if you wish me to add one more, I can tell you number three, you must know how to learn from those who have been fishing for a long time. The power of mentorship. You must submit yourself to other skilled fishermen with proof. Because sometimes it may be that your fishing is ineffective and you may not have died yet, but you almost died at sea. The next time you go, you may die there. So whilst you've had the opportunity to retreat now, let somebody who has gained mastery over fishing teach you, correct certain things. Then you can go back now with greater efficiency. Let me conclude by saying this. Your love for Jesus alongside your desire to please him must be greater than your desire for ministry, fame, power, money, and even evangelism. Let me take it again. That your love for Jesus Christ, the greatest addition to all of these seven points that I would give you, or one final addition, to become an effective fisher of men, haven't taught you everything around the sea. Fishing men is beyond going to the sea. Your love for Jesus, alongside your desire to please him, must be greater than your desire for ministry, must be greater than your desire for fame, must be greater than your desire for power, must be greater than your desire for money, must even be greater than your desire for evangelism. Evangelism can become an idol. The quest for money can become an idol. The quest for doing ministry can become an idol. Just because you are standing on the pulpit and holding a mic does not mean you love Jesus. I cannot end this very important discussion without challenging you that when all is said and done, beyond fishing, no matter how effective, your love for Jesus is what is most important. Jesus himself said in that day, some will say we healed in your name. Good fishing. In that day, some will say we casted out devils in your name. But he will say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. The problem is not the fishing. The problem is the fisherman. The fisher of men. Hallelujah. Beyond the ability to fish, beyond your ability to win souls, you must be sure. I hope you are not a fish yourself. Who needs to be saved? It becomes a tragedy when the unsaved person is the one who is trying to save others. Paul said, let it not be that after I have preached, I myself will be a castaway. Are you ready to pray? Please rise up on your feet as we pray. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you soul winners. I will make you witnesses. We have two prayers to pray tonight, and I want you to pray this prayer with all your heart. Prayer point number one. I obtain grace to be a fisher of men. Go ahead and pray. I obtain grace to be a fisher of men. Someone is praying that I will not just watch the lost. I will not roam around the sea and not catch men for Jesus. That every time I see an unsaved person, that burden is not just left to missionaries and mission agencies. You are not a believer with maturity and stature if the passion for souls is not in your heart this is not until it's not only when you are an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a teacher mounting the pulpit the passion for soul winning the work of an evangelist is every believer's business therefore open your mouth and cry obtain grace from god obtain grace from god obtain grace from god obtain grace from god in the name of Jesus, obtain grace from God. 
Shabreka parakatos kadi brande gabalados. Great harvest through my life. Great harvest through my life. Great harvest through my life. I bring you great harvest through my life. I bring you great harvest through my life. I bring you great harvest through my life. Hallelujah. Final prayer point. You are going to pray for efficiency. You can be a fisherman like you have been taught or a fisher of men. And yet your witness is so ineffective. You are barely able to do anything. As a pastor, as an apostle, as a prophet, as a teacher, as a kingdom businessman, in whatever ministerial dimension you find yourself, we are going to pray. All of these keys are the training manual for your efficiency. You know the area where you are found wanting. Maybe you are part of those who have made the sea boisterous. Maybe you have lacked the patience and the discipline to allow the fish come. Maybe you have forgotten, sincerely so, where he saved you from. Maybe you have not even studied the sea where you are going to be fishing. Maybe you lack a boat. Maybe you lack a net or your net is torn. In any case, raise a voice, your voice and pray in one minute that God should help you to be efficient. Go ahead and pray. That much souls will come through my life. Much souls will come through my witness. Someone who loves Jesus is praying. Much souls. Shali toska pranda gabarakosh. Much souls through my life, much souls through my witness. Are you crying? In Jesus' name. Now, give me one minute. I want you to mention the name of anyone you know in and around your life or your space who is unsaved. Let's intercede for those persons in the next one or two minutes. Lord, they will not die. Go ahead and pray. Whether you like the person or not is not the issue. I like you to pray. Pray like a believer that you are. It may be your husband who is not saved. Pray that you will not go to hell. Not with what you have learned. You are not just a believer. You are a fisher of men. It may be your brother, your sibling. Maybe an uncle, maybe an auntie. Maybe a colleague in the office. Someone pray. I intercede. Shadike peke parunda ska braga bereka tos kalibrash rakata peke te pranda kabaraka tos yata. Save to the uttermost, O God. Save to the uttermost, O God. Save to the uttermost, O God. Let every unsaved person in our lives come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Let backsliders return home. Let those who have deviated from the path of righteousness, the path of salvation that they will come home they will come home they will come home in the name of Jesus in Jesus name we pray hallelujah every koinonia service is like a fisherman throwing a net regardless the salmon in that salmon there is a net that is thrown and the Bible says that the net catches multitude of fish. In this place right now, there are many kinds of people. There are believers, serious Christians, unserious Christians, unsaved people, those like Zacchaeus who are already close to the kingdom. I want to make a call right now. You cannot hear a sermon like this and sear your conscience and say it does not matter and walk away i know that someone who was sent by god on hearing me teach even though i was talking about the fisher of men you were thinking of that fish because like that fish you are that soul that needs to find jesus tonight two calls in one you are in this place and you are saying apostle i have to be honest with myself and my destiny i have never truly made jesus lord of my life i've been around church i come to be a good person but I cannot say for sure 
that I've made Jesus Lord of my life. Or you are saying, Apostle, I've been part of church, but right now I cannot say my ways are right with God. I need to rededicate my life. I'm going to make this call, counting one to five, wherever you are. I will require that you pick your bags and your Bibles as I begin to count and whatever you came to church with. Please, very quickly, outside, inside, everywhere, make your way to the front right here or make your way to any of the LEDs in front of you. I begin my counting now. Please stand, my sister. God bless you. For everyone who needs to come, I begin my counting now. Rush, leave your seat and come. One. Koinonia, let's celebrate them. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and life. He says, no man cometh to the Father except by me. Ye must be born again. You can make your ways right. Like the prodigal son, you can return back to your father. Let's keep clapping as they come. Two. Apostle, I want to come, but I'm ashamed. Will God accept me? Make your way to the front. Absolutely. For as many who will come to him, the Bible declares that he will in no wise cast away. Three more counts. Three. Let's celebrate them as they come. You're coming from outside. Please hurry up. Once I count five, we'll have to pray. Four. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm a good person, but I'm not sure if I'm saved. Go ahead and join them. You can have the assurance of salvation. Today is that day of salvation for you. I see people coming from the aisles. Let's celebrate them as they come. I see men and women coming from the aisles. God bless you. Bless you for your courage to make it right with Jesus. Bless you for loving Jesus enough to leave your seat and come. Young and old, male and female, that includes those who are following from across the nations. You must be born again. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. I want to thank every one of you for this great decision. You have summoned that courage to come and stand before Jesus, young and old, male and female. The Bible declares that as many who will come to him, he will in no wise cast away. I want to lead you to make a prayer that includes those at the overflows and those who are following online. Please do not lose this opportunity to make it right with Jesus. For those in front, my brothers and my sisters, may I request that you lift your right hand high above your head as a sign of surrender and say this convincingly, let it be loud and let it be clear. Say, Lord Jesus. Say it again, Lord Jesus. Tonight, I have heard your word. I love you with all my heart. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. I declare that from today, you are my savior, you are my Lord, and you are my king. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. I am a child of God. I go forward ever and backward never. Amen. Keep your beautiful hands lifted. Father, thank you for this wonderful people. They have made their declarations of faith and the Bible says that if we confess your Lordship and believe that you were raised from the dead, we are saved. I declare by the authority of scripture that your sins are forgiven and I declare that from today and for the rest of your life, you are bona fide recipients of the life of God. We call you believers. You are part of the fold of this kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and you go forward ever and backward never. In Jesus name we pray. Amen and amen. Please do me a favor by looking to my right. That will be your left. You will see a group of counselors. They are waving their plaque, their placards. Please do well to follow them. They will have a word with you very quickly. And then you are back to your seat. Koinonia, let's give them a big, big God bless you.
Hallelujah. What is your assignment for this week? Number one, listen to this message again. Number two, become a fisher of men. Let me repeat it again. Number one, listen to this teaching. Number two, become a fisher of men. That means between now and Sunday, it's impossible to say you did not find anybody to save. It's, it's a lie. I, it, and if that is what is in your heart, in Jesus' name, may God bring sinners your way that you will save. In Jesus' mighty name, I, I've prayed it already. God has answered it. You can't say from Monday till Koinonia Sunday, you did not collide with someone who needs Jesus or needs to rededicate his life. You need to be active. It's important that you are active as far as this soul winning business is concerned. And the Lord will bless you and honor you in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, they that be wise, they shall shine like the stars. And they, the firmament, they that turn many to righteousness, they will be as the stars even forevermore. That should be Daniel 12, 3 or so. It's a, it's a blessing that follows soul winners. Hallelujah. Can I speak the blessing over your life? In the name of Jesus Christ, I call you fishers of men. Amen. I call you fishers of men. Amen. Massive soul winners. Amen. You are bringing many to the kingdom. Amen. You are restoring the fallen and bringing them to Jesus. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I decree and declare that whilst you are at the business of winning souls, may God sort everything that needs to be sorted in your life. For many of you, at the point of soul winning, you will find your destiny help us. At the point of soul winning, you will find those God has ordained to lift you. At the point of soul winning, you will find your spouse. At the point of soul winning, you will find a good job. At the point of soul winning, you will stumble into prepared blessings. In the name of Jesus Christ, let honor not depart from your house. Let favor not depart from your house. Let goodness and mercy follow you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I call you the blessed of the Lord. I call you the lifted of the Lord. I call you the anointed of the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. The sounds of joy and rejoicing will never depart from your tent. It will be good news all through this week. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Together let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forever. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercies follow us all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen. God bless you. See you on Sunday.
Sim.